Hi, we're starting up the stream. I'm just checking for transcoder option, like I usually do. All right, got it. First try again. Been uh, having a lot of good luck with that. All right, connection seems good. So, hello, my friends. This is stream number 434. I've been working on this for a while. I um, am working on a game, and I recently decided I'm going to rewrite it in Rust. I'm working on the front end of the game right now. Uh, there's not much there yet, so we're still working on the, the di different login systems. Uh, the first one that I want to have in there is the administrator login, which involves um, making several WebSocket connections and authenticating using uh, signatures made with a private key. So I've been working on this the last couple of days. Here's the plan for today. I'd like to be able to retain the key in local storage so you don't have to keep selecting it from the file system. Uh, I want to be able to like, uh, this is new, actually I didn't have this before in the JavaScript version. I want to actually have a separate button to actually trigger the login once we have the key loaded. So basically load the key would be one step and the second step would be to actually log in. And then I want to have another button to forget the admin key. Um, that would go along with the use the admin key. So if you enter the admin key and then you decide I actually don't actually want to use it, then you can also you can just say forget. Uh, I think I also want to I want to add something to this right here. We want to show the admin login controls if we have a key, even if admin was. Oh, even even I'll just, let's just keep it simple. Even if admin login mode was not initially enabled. So basically right now it's not enabled here because we have no control to log in as the administrator. It's an actual extra button here to, to, to enable it. I have it where you have to actually put admin in the query string and that's mostly just so that I don't really want it to show up to the casual user because there's no reason to, it just cl clutters the UI. Um, a very, very small number of people, right now it's just me, needs this. So right now um, I have to enable it manually. Uh, I wanna make it so that once we actually load a key, it just shows up if, if I hit refresh. Right now if I hit refresh, it goes away, right? So have it retain the key and then keep it and then keep showing this admin UI here, which I still need to clean up, um, until we either, um, well, until I basically unload it from local storage. I want it to stay loaded. So, retaining it in local storage. We did this in JavaScript, so let me go um, check that out. Oh, I forgot to make sure my today commands are working and chat is working. Okay, good. I think that link is correct. All right. One more thing I forgot to do, and now it's done. Okay. Who's going to be first in chat today? We don't know. I can make a guess. I'm going to guess it's someone I haven't seen before. Or it's going to be someone who hardly ever chats. Okay. Okay. Actually, I didn't clean up the bookmarks I had from last time, so let's do that. Okay, um, let me find the place where we're dealing with this admin key. That's in the sitting outside task uh, activity, right? So then, hmm. Where we actually load is where we're going to store it in local storage, right? So that would be here in admin key loaded, I believe. Right, yeah, right after we we uh, load it, but before, yeah, before we parse it. I'll have to have an extra copath here. What if we load it and we get an error parsing it, right? Hey there, Lumacode, you are number one today. How are you do doing? I'm sorry you got an ad. <laughs> I have no control, well I have very little control over ads. I can either force you to always get one, or I can make it so that you um, are less likely to get one at the front, but you might get, you might get them throw out, um, based off of the number of people actually see the ads. I wish I had more control over that. 
Actually, no, that's not the choice I have. It's either you you'll get an ad when you first join the ch when you ever you first start watching the channel, or I can I can manually run the ad occasionally to control when you see the ad. Join the Belgian military. <laughs> that's a funny one. Well, welcome. Yeah, so if I like knew that I had to take a break for three minutes and I knew it wouldn't tick people off, I could run ads during breaks so that people don't need to s don't run into ads at other times when I'm not on break. And I know it just seems kind of creepy for me to manually run ads. It's it's like it's like I'm actively participating in the exploitation of viewers. Although it's not technically exploitation because it's a otherwise it's a it's a it's an ad driven service, right? You don't have to pay to watch Twitch, but if people don't like ads, so I don't really want to get involved with with when you see them. I'd rather it not be something you can't blame <laughs> blame me for. Yeah, but it's like a hard choice though. If I don't manually run the ads, then Twitch basically says they're gonna run them when I don't know when. So if you're gonna see them regardless of when whether I um of, of when I say or not then you, you can make the argument that me manually running the ads during a break could might be l a little less annoying because I I would be just be showing a BRB screen anyway. But it still makes me feel dirty that I if I get involved with the ads. Okay, here's where I want to save our key. But I need to handle this error case. If we couldn't parse the key, I guess what I want to do is... I drop it back out of local storage as well as showing the error message, right? So we need to do both. And uh, let me get the documentation up because probably local storage has a uh, API in you. You click and click. So there probably is a service for storage. Just need to find it. Services, storage. Here we go. Storage service. So we need to specify the area, which will do local, right? That's not so bad. It can fail, which I don't think it will. So we'll just unwrap it. So let storage equal storage service new uh, area local unwrap. So we need to pull in some things, right? Storage service and area. Area is sort of something that's too vague, so I'd rather say storage area and import storage. I think that makes me feel a little bit better. Okay, so now we have access to local storage. What can we do with it? We can store and we can restore and we can remove. Cool. So we can store anything that can be turned into text. That's fine. So I can probably just store the key text as it is, right? So I can say storage dot store. Uh, let's use the same key that I had in the JavaScript version. So let me bookmark this and then find the JavaScript version of this. Let me think about where that might be. Probably in the middleware for authentication. Yeah, there it is. So it was admin key. Okay, and then the value is going to be that uh, PEM. And we need to say OK PEM because of the weird nature of text. A text is actually result, string, or error. So it, it doesn't make sense to store an error, so we're, we'll store an OK. Oh, PEM is not a string, it's a clone on write, so we probably want to do an owned, or into owned, right? I can't do into owned, let's do a clone. Because we're going to use PEM down here. Is that not good enough? Convert, oh, um, clone just makes another clone on write. What's the method to actually clone it? Would it be two owned? And, right, two owned instead of into owned? No? 
two owned is still self owned, which is what I guess we need to look at um, clone on right. I want a string out of a clone on right. How do I get that? I guess it depends on what the type is. Yeah, I haven't used clone on write very much. It's probably easier to just review the documentation here, right? Let's study cows. Oh, well, I'm in the wrong. What am I doing? It's not a lib. It's not a. It's not a crate. It's in the standard library. Into owned. That's not exactly what I want, right? Actually, I guess we could make it into owned and then clone it. Because parse private key takes something that turns into a string. So I could just say that dot to owned and we'll get a string here, right? No, we don't. Into owned, not to owned. Right, and then I will uh, clone it here. Okay, storage probably, yeah, it needs to be mutable. Let mutable. And now we got it. Okay, so I want to handle the error too, right? Oh, this is synchronous. So I could wait until um, we successfully parse it to store it, then you don't have to remove it. Oh, no, no, it's it's... It's synchronous for part of it, but there's an asynchronous part. So this handles the synchronous error. So actually, I could just delay this part until the else here. But we still have to uh, remove the PEM. So yeah, we want to clone it here and use the original there. So yeah, we'll want to... Um, Remove it if we don't get a parsed. What actually, what happens if we don't get a parsed? Oh, it's always it's guaranteed to work. So if I didn't have an unwrap here, and there's another unwrap there, is that because a future right the the future could um not succeed as well. So there's multiple points right now we just assume success. So I actually haven't tested this. What if we try to import something that was PEM format but isn't PKCS8? I might have to turn one of these unwraps into um, actually handling the error path there. Hey there, LG. How are you doing? Maybe I'll worry about that later. Uh, maybe put a... Put a, put a to-do here. The thing is, it's asynchronous, right? So that probably means I'll need two callbacks. Or I'll need a callback that can take a result. Actually, that's probably better, right? So uh, let me just put a to-do here. We probably want to... Allow asynchronous failure by returning a, or well, by emitting a result crypto key. Rather than calling unwind, unwrap. Could you return a failure? We're re already returning failure for, um, that's mostly for this if it, you can't extract it from a PEM, right? But yeah, we're not returning failures if it fails to import or if the promise fails. Actually, I'm not quite sure what's the difference here. I'm guessing the JS feature never fails, so this unwrap probably can we keep. But here, rather than unwrapping this, if import key with object can give us a, a failure, we'll want to um, pass along that failure out of the... Um, Oh, when we emit it back to the callback. This emit here, right? 
Actually, that makes me think that we would just delete this unwrap because we would be getting a result. Right? Hey there, A squared. How are you doing? Anyway, I'm going to do this later. Mark it with the do to do for now. So I really just need to worry about um, on uh, removing the key if we um, wanted to unload it later. So that, that'll come later. So let's, so this should be done. Let me test it by, um, oh, no, there's a sub thing here. You, um, auto automatically load admin key if it's found in local storage on startup. Let's do that one too. So this is storing it. Now to load it. Let me think about it. I suppose we I suppose we want to do that in create, right? It's not in our props. Yeah. So let's do it in create right here. Hey there, lazy guru, how are you? Okay, so I will get storage again. Instead of store, we're probably going to do a load, right? And this probably doesn't need to be mutable. Dot, is it just restore? Admin key? And what does that give me back? It gives me back the T. So I'll want to say something like, um, let admin key well let pem equal really and this should be like an if let some or if let okay pem equal that otherwise actually if it fails to load does it automatically get removed or do we need to do it Can't restore. Oh, I suppose if we can't restore, that means it wasn't there. So I don't need an else then. I'm pretty good, Lazy Guru. C move NE is a magical instruction. Sounds like. Is it conditional move when, if not equal to? Looking at some Rust cogen and invalid bit patterns, and there's so much weirdness. Huh. Yeah, it sounds like conditional move if not equal. So it's... It's a branch and a move built into the same instruction. Yeah, this is going to give me warnings until... Oh, it actually knows it's a string? How does it know it's a string? Because I didn't tell it it could be a string. It just says from text. It shouldn't know that it's string. Anyway, um... It will have to be string the way I use it. Uh, what I want to do is if, if we load it, then we want to do the same thing as if it's loaded here. So actually, this code I want in a common place. As long as I could call... Can I call a link before it's constructed? I think I can if I do something like this. Let mute this equal that, this. And then I put the code here, down here. A match bool is, is basically just a conditional move not equal. Makes sense. Yeah. Compare that to debug mode assembly, which does a specific check jumps and store stuff. Ah. So it's an optimization of, 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 of a sort. Yeah, this whole thing I want to extract as a method because we're going to call it from one of those two places, right? Let's say impulse sitting outside activity. Function um, load admin key. Mute self. Uh, the key will, so the pem is a string or t where t is into string if we want to be nice about it. It's a good habit to have, right? Paste that code there. 
uh, should render. Oh, we should, um, yeah, we should return this should render. Oh, did I not, f I didn't, um, import it. I would like to import that. Okay, so then, uh, let, well, actually, this is easy. It's, uh, true, false. Okay, so this is into. All right, and that function's ready for us to use. Uh, and this was another, oh no, there's another error here. Oh, right, uh, shoot. We have to do the into early here. So let pem equal pem into, again, this does need to be a clone because we're using it twice uh, in two contexts that need to own it. Parse private key, why does it need to own the string? Does this really need to own it? It doesn't. That doesn't need it. Why do I have it into string there? Yeah, this is a mistake. It should be as ref str, and then this can be as string, or um, as ref. Yeah, then there's no reason for me to... I don't know why I didn't see that yesterday. We don't need to own the string at all. So um, this doesn't need to clone it. It will actually uh, slice it. This does need to own it, right? The store requires a string. Requires into string. Yeah, so it, it, needs, it needs an owned value. All right, cool. So then I'm going to use it down here. Self dot load admin key uh, pem. All right, and then I'm going to reuse it up here to load it automatically on start. And this should be this, which means that needs, yeah, it's mutable. Okay, so now it should automatically reload it if it's stored in local storage. Hey there, Resubaka, and Iwikal. How are you doing? And MetroDev, how are you? If some experience it, what would it look like to code sign a Rust binary? I don't know all of the technical detail about code signing, but conceptually, it's just attaching a signature to the binary in such a way, in a, in a standard way that tools designed to check code signatures know where to find it and can use it but i don't know those technical details but what i but on a high level view what it would, would look like is essentially the same kind of code uh, same kind of signing that i did yesterday which is you take this thing to be signed and you put it through a hash function and the, with the digest um you uh, sign it with using your private key, and then that signature you then associate or attach to that binary. Th those details I wouldn't, I don't know. But anyway, hello. <laughs> Passing out waves. Okay. So if I test this, it's fine. I'll just have to delete the key when I'm done. Recompiling. All right, so then. Admin. All right, okay, so now we'll load the key in. Okay, now let me check to see if it's there. Yep, there it is. Private key's there. So now if I were to um, browse back to the front again, yeah, then it automatically logs in. So it works. If I go here and delete the key, and then do the same thing. We should be back to the start again. Yeah, cool. So we're done with one item. Get cola. Okay, this is essentially uh, save admin key in local storage. 
load admin key from local in in local storage win set load admin key from local storage on creation thank you for the follow i appreciate it so this is um management of admin key and local storage all right first work item done next is to uh, add a button to trigger it in enabled by the presence of the key so let's do that all right so um that has to do with separating the the parsing from the uh from the actual connection right hey there p4 sick That reminds me of Perforce. Perforce, the client command was P4. <laughs> so it's always like P4 submit, or what was it? P4 add, P4 submit. And they called it a change list instead of a commit. All right. I'm just looking around to see where do we actually... Uh, Where do we actually use the key once it's parsed and stuff? Can we keep parsed? Yes. Oh, right. We delegated it up. So that's this level, right? So what do we say we're going to do with it? There's an admin key loaded. Right, so this jumps directly into... So I want to separate this. I want um, this to not to be that it's loaded, but... We want to basically rename this, so I'm going to do that now. This should be, um... Um... Login as admin. That's what it should be. Thank you for the, uh, follow there. Oh, it's just an A? I'm just so used to, uh... For years and years, we used Perforce, so it would be big. P4 add, P4 submit. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, P4 sick. So it's PASIC. Got it. See, I'm just biased from using Perforce for years. Okay, login as admin. So this this is great. This is great, uh, except for this needs to be updated. Login as admin. It didn't know to replace that because this is inside of an HTML macro. Okay, so login as admin. I forget why I stored it there. Is there a reason why I did that? I don't think there was any reason for that. Oh, no, there is a reason. It's used inside of the view uh, to pass along the prop here. That's right. Which makes sense. So, this shouldn't be on admin key loaded anymore. It should be like on login as admin. So back to the sitting outside activity. We'll rename the prop now. On, yeah, so this one. On login as admin. Right, so now, now I need to separate parsing from actually logging in. So I will do that. And I need to have now a separate button which actually does this. So yeah, we don't need to clone it anymore. Yeah, so I need another button. In this thing, right? So after the label, I guess, would be some kind of button. Uh, yeah, like one of these. Uh, I shouldn't trust this to auto format things. It's going to do it anyway, isn't it? Okay, hold on a second. Scratchy throat usually means that I haven't been hydrating enough. Hydrating enough. Message, this should be uh, log login as admin.
What's with the opening of these? Make it a fragment because just like in React, the parent of all this HTML is only allowed to have one child. So if I got removed, r rid of the fragment, I would get an error saying that there are multiple nodes and HTML can only have one. And it actually even uh, gives you a hint that you can wrap multiple HTML in a fragment, just like in React. So when the, um, when the DOM is constructed, all the fragments are, are flattened out. Okay, so we just need to add this uh, message. There we go. Yeah, it is kind of neat. I think they, I think the U developers took that direct, that took that idea directly from React. And if React got it from somewhere else, we should give credit. But I don't know. <laughs> if someone knows who came up with that idea first, uh, you're welcome to say. The first time I've ever had ever seen it was with React. Okay, so here's where I'm going to put that uh, commented out code. Should have bookmarked it. Where was it? Right here. So this moves down to here, right? And this should be self.adminkey.clone, right? Oh, right. And we only want to do it if we have one. So this should be if let some admin key equals self.adminkey. Uh, borrow it in order to clone it. All right. So much of a hack from weird legacy HTML things. I, I think it's just to simplify the macro and I, and whatever Re React would do would be for a similar reason in that they can simplify it so that HTML macro only has one node inside. And that one node could be the fragment. So basically, they've uh, separated the con concern between structure and multiplicity. Let the HTML, uh, let, let the HTML macro and and such handle with the structure. Right. Whenever you have one of these nodes, it can have one child node. And if you have a one to many, like one parent to many child children. That's what fragment handles, and it doesn't need to handle anything else in the structure other than one parent, many children. And then you have a final flattened thing that that removes it. But you can build DSLs like that with uh, macros. It's pretty dang cool, right? But it's not original in Rust. Like in uh, React, it's they call this JSX, right? It's uh, another DSL mixing HTML in a different language. Here we're mixing it with Rust, but there in JSX they mixed it with JavaScript. Definitely not. I, I was amazed the first time I saw it. I think anything that looks new and cool and intuitive and it's like, why didn't that always exist, can seem amazing if you had not seen it before. The parser for it is wild. I don't doubt it. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. It definitely uh, prevents tools like rust analyzer from working well like if i uh if i rename that message it won't rename it here because rust analyzer is too timid to look into macros to see that that is the same identifier another another thing is i can't control click anything here whereas outside the macro i can control click things to get to the definitions i can't do that to anything inside that macro because again rust analyzer is is doesn't know the syntax of the macro well enough and can't get it through reflection because probably the developers of Rust Analyzer haven't gotten that code to be sophisticated enough. I'm sure it's possible if you reverse or study the macro, but yeah, you can't control click on anything and it isn't, um, is not included in any kind of automatic refactoring. So that's the cost of having this exotic syntax. It's way too hard. Yeah. Well, Way too hard for one person might mean fun challenge for another person, right? <laughs> okay, so if this worked, I should have an extra button, but I don't want that button to always appear. I only want that to appear if we have a key. So let's do let's do it this way. If self dot prop the self dot admin key is some. Uh, let's say let um, login button equal. If it's that, then HTML 
else HTML empty. And then we can use login button here. Oh, I shouldn't have deleted it. I need that. I need to move that up to here. Now I can delete it. All right, pass the syntax check. <laughs> hey there, Radon90, how are you doing? Look at that diamond gear that you have, one year subscriber. Wow. Okay. Let's see if that worked. So, admin. So I choose the file. Uh, oh, we didn't tell it to re-render. Shoot, I missed that. Um, I'll have to delete it out of local storage. When we set the key, we need to tell it it needs rendering again. So that was uh, here, right? So should renders should be true. Hey there, Dr. Padawan. Welcome to the stream. This reloaded, right? Oh, it was, it was reloading. Perfect opportunity for me to pause and read chat, right? <laughs> You're certain that tooling will catch up once it becomes popular enough? Just look at React? Yeah. Hopefully, things just get better as we go. More sophisticated, more intuitive, more inclusive. There's my huge login as admin button. Click, and we log in. Awesome. And if I go back to this... We have the, uh, what if I hit reload? Right, I need to make that work. Okay, now I want to turn this load thing into, um, it should show the input box if we don't have a key, but if we do have a key, it should become a button that says forget admin key. I think that's what I want to do next, but... Um, Let's uh, do it manually for now. I guess, no, we can keep it. Let's just check this in. So this is a separation of loading the key from actually logging in with it. So separate loading admin key from logging in as admin. And check all that stuff in. All right, good. Next. I want to, like I said before, I want to have like a remove login as admin button. Or remove, uh, forget admin key button. You can imagine any template literal as a function. What's a, what is a problem to analyze this type graph? I think the, the, in the context of talking about macros, the problem is that the macro syntax is, uh, built at compile time. It's not known before it's compiled. So there's like an extra step at least in the compilation because you first have to compile the macros and then once you have the macro compilations, you can use those to expand other syntax to be compiled. And I, have, I don't really know how it works in with, Re, uh, with um, React though. I'm just talking about the uh, Rust macros. Yeah. I would trust a, a squared that they're pretty wild. I tried to uh, learn it and I learned some of it, but not enough where I'm, I would say I'm comfortable. Uh, do I have a link to that? This is back in December. We were looking at this, right? Maybe it was November. Oh, maybe it was earlier than that. At one point I was looking at procedural macros, right? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, the, it was um, the the workshop for procedural macros, this thing. So this is the what I tried to go through, and it was a little bit tough. I learned a little bit, but not enough. I need to revisit that uh, in the future. It gave me enough of an experience to know that it's like hard. It's the it's the more challenging part of Rust. <laughs> That and uh, asynchronous code. Yeah, 
Yeah, add button to forget admin key. Sounds good to me. So that's yet another action while we're sitting outside, right? So I might as well just add that as a message. Forget admin key. And uh, we can immediately go to where the syntax error shows up and fix it by filling match arms. I wish, again, I wish it would sort these alph alphabetically. Okay, so the code for forget admin would be something similar to uh, to store or restore, right? A restore this. I'm guessing it has to be mutable, so it would be um, remove, right? And does that return anything? No, it does not. So we just call it. Call it, and then we need to remove our copy of it too. Self.adminkey.take, and then we sh always should render again. All right. Now I need to add a button that triggers that. So down here. Yeah. So I think this would be if we don't have a key and an else button if we do have a key. So this this would like be let um, input or forget if self dot admin key dot just it just occurred to me that we're testing on both. So should I combine these two? I should probably just combine these two then. So then um, I would just have an inner if. Whoa. I don't know who this is, but I might have to answer this. I'll be right back. Probably a spam call, but we'll find out.
I'm sorry about that. That was uh, actually my new boss. So had to talk to him. <laughs> it's not like you can't say to your new boss, uh, I don't want to talk to you right now. <laughs> Let's see what I missed while I was gone. Self admin key is none would probably better take returns of value. For um, where I okay, I missed right for this right. I I was wondering about that. So, do most people writing Rust prefer the assigning none to an option versus doing a take? Because I've seen both. To me, like, as, like, having a neutral opinion, not really caring one way or another, when I analyze this, I see that their main effect is the same. And so the difference is really, do you get a return value or not? And Rust is perfectly fine if it's not a must-use return value, being okay with you not using it. So you can see it doesn't give me a warning. Um, this basically is a statement saying that I don't want the return value. This mean, could mean like I might want the return value. So I can kind of agree with you that this this could be considered better because I'm not, I'm explicitly I'm making a claim that I don't want to have, I don't need or want the return value. But I've also seen people do this and I was wondering like, is that just um, a more, f a more uh, cultural way to do it in Rust, so to speak? Take is for when you need to return the value. Yeah, but I've seen people do it where they do take and then they just terminate it with a semicolon. They don't actually use return value. So I'm like, wasn't quite sure. So I guess I haven't seen enough Rust code to know which way is generally preferred over the other, but I can agree with you that 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 I would pick that if um, nothing else. Um, so I'm actually kind of curious, why did I type that? I might have typed that because it was still in my memory from seeing some code where, where they did it that way. Let's go with your way. But I can give you a point. That was A squared, right? Yes. If you want a several similar ergonomics for the DSL, I'm assuming they'd have to fork Rust Analyzer or something. Yeah, may maybe. Where are the anime backgrounds? <laughs> How are you doing, Raimi? And wowie, sir. And hello, Nui. Honestly, they probably compile the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, the intent is important, right? Because someone reading the code will get confused saying, well, what, why did he ask for the return value and not use it, right? Yeah, we'll go with that. Also, hello, Fanat Flesha. You have the preprocessor at build time that will change JSX in the function calls? Yeah. So that's somewhat what this HTML macro actually does in practice, right? This goes through a procedural macro to emit syntax, which is then compiled into Rust. So this actually has um, a um, rendering, so to speak. And you can actually ask the tools to give you the or process, processed output, right? You can get the processed output of the macro and you'll get another copy of your .rs file, which is equivalent to the input only with the macros unrolled or processed or however you want to call it. Okay, so um, yeah, I wanted to combine this two, right? So if it's some else, and we'll just put them all in the same HTML, I think. Only we're going to have two things, so we're going to have to make a fragment on both, right? No, actually. Oh, no, you, yes, 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 yes. So, uh, yeah. If we have a key, then we can log in with it. And we can also forget it. So this is forget admin key, right? Forget admin key. If we don't have an admin key, then we want that input. Oh, then I don't need a fragment, right? I wonder why I thought I needed a fragment there. I, I might be missing something, but eh, it's okay. We'll figure it out when I get to there. I think that's what I want, right? Yeah, let's try that. 
feel like I'm missing something, but that's okay. We'll find out when we run it, right? Yes. Do I look so boilerplate and too imperative? Wait. I missed something. Oh, using take here seems to me like a point or a place instead of a right, but they probably could optimize the same thing. Okay. Imagine a take is implemented with a mem swap. Okay. Why is look so boilerplate and too imperative? You mean the view? The view is really just giving a template for the DOM, right? And there is there are alternatives to the DOM. There's actually three alternatives here, right? You can either show the input and already have a key, show the input and not yet have a key, or you can be not even showing the input stuff at all. And and those alternative views, I guess instead of using ifs, I could do um I could have an enum and do a match. But yeah, I would have three alternatives, right? And then this is the part of the template which is the same no matter what the templates are. So here's where it plugs in the, the alternatives. And I think that that's by design. The view is really just generating a template for the DOM to um, show the user interface of this component. So it's going to look like a template. You mean the code overall? Well, I have to fit it within the U, the U framework structure, which is to implement their component interface. So um, that part's pretty imperative. Why no pattern matching? Uh, you mean as in looking at the prop I've been given or if I have a key or not? Like, yeah, like I was saying, I could turn those into uh, an enum and then use a, a match to um, match it against the three different patterns. Some kind of declarative description? Well, this is declarative description. I guess I'm not following you. This this is by definition declarative, right? We're declaring a div component, declaring an H1. Parts of it are not declarative because there's variance depending on the props and the state. Doesn't use the data here. We're using some of the data. We're using the prop and whether or not we have a key to decide which declarations to include. So I would say it's a mix. The in the in, Everything inside HTML here is declarative, but yeah, sure, we have some imperative stuff outside. But um, I guess you're you're implying that it should have more pattern matching and it should be more declarative, and I'm I guess I'm not understanding why and how. So it's probably just a uh, uh, not understanding what you're getting at. I'm happy to look at like if you have an example of. Uh, of, of a U app that is more declarative, uses more pattern matching, maybe I'm missing something. U actually has uh, a bunch of examples. So if there's one of those examples that's maybe pointing out a pattern I should be using, uh, it would be great to know that. Um, to get there, we go back to the libs, go to U. I got a bunch of examples here, which is pretty cool. It offsets the fact that they have not so many documents. So in one, in there are a bunch of examples. The one I was looking at yesterday was the uh, nested components, I think, nested list. And from that, I learned how to do the uh, weak link. Right, this list had a weak link in it. Where is it? Weak component link. Right, learn how to do that and. What was the other thing I learned how to do? I think it was this, to wrap a callback to change its type. But yeah, um, you can see that in their view, they also have you know somewhat in, um, imperative stuff, but, but they also, it's, all, it's a similar mix, right? They have, they have part of the DOM is using um, a branch, and the other part is using a, a template, and that looks kind of like mine. So as far as I know, I'm kind of following this, their examples, so I don't know if I'm missing anything. Is Rust able to match on multiple values? Yes. If so, the nested if could be a single... Yeah, that's what I was saying. I could change this into a single if, if I put all the information together, and one convenient way would be to have a three-state enum, because essentially I have three states, right? I have that we're not in admin input mode at all, 
or we are in admin input mode and we have a key, or we're in admin input mode and we don't have a key. So that's that's three states, right? So I could clean this up a little bit by having a three variant enum and having a match for this whole thing. So, I mean, we can do that. That would be an interesting experience. Um, let me um, let me do that as a refactoring step. Let me get this, let me make sure this is working first. Did I tested this, right? Actually, no, I haven't tested it yet. Let's test it first. So, admin, and we have a key, right? So forget the admin key. So that's all three, that's all three states I just ran through. Either we're not supposed to show it, we're supposed to show it and we have a key, or we're supposed to show it and we don't have a key. And then I can get the key back by adding it. And then I can not show it just by hitting refresh. But actually, I want to kind of change that. I want to say, I want, um, if we have a key, it should um, always show the, always show it, I think. This component is too big, two plus screen. Too big. You mean my template is too big? Okay. So you'd want me to, what, split it somehow? You're probably right. Like, um, this uh, footer ha footer matter could be um, a static HTML, because I don't think anything is... I don't think anything here uses any props or state, right? So this, should, could, this could just be some kind of static fragment that we construct somewhere else, right? And then this could be another component like like login component, login new account component, and this is a special um, password ret password reset component. Yeah, I just haven't refactored that stuff yet. This really doesn't have too much that you should split out. Well, I mean, to go to Finette's point, sure. If the rule of thumb is that a component's view is too long if it exceeds a certain length in pages, so we set a rule of thumb that like, I don't know, maybe 50 lines or something like that, right? It exceeds 50 lines, because Rust itself has these some of these uh, guidelines built in, right? If, if I have a function and it gets too long, I'll start to get a warning from Clippy saying that the function is too long, you should try to refactor it. So we could have the similar thing for this view. It gets too long and then I can consider, yes, these have different concerns. This is a static part, that's one concern. This is concerning logging in, separate concern, right? And this is Forgot your password flow, uh, uh, yet another flow uh, pattern. And then, so this could be reduced to uh, four element div. Error message, password reset flow, login flow, and static stuff, right? And then um, it would be a lot shorter. So I, I'll, I'll, I could do that as a refactoring step at some point. Hey there, Mr. Halsey, how are you doing? Just want to say it's really hard to understand 300 plus lines of HTML. Yes, I, I agree. So, um... I have a general flow that I like to talk about, um, and it is under my stream notes. So just to kind of um, explain why I am not right now shortening it to make it easy to understand, it goes to what I usually do in my workflow. And everyone has a different workflow, right? So I'm not saying one workflow is right and the others are wrong, uh, but my workflow is um, order, I call it the order of dev operations. So usually I try to um, make stuff work as the first step. So define and pass test requirements and implementation first. Then I try to go back and make it right. So this is probably where I would go back and do uh, implement Fanat's recommendations, like go back and make it more readable, right? Make it easier to understand, right? Which means it's more maintainable, it's more idiomatic. And that involves refactoring, right? So sometimes I'll, I'll go to step two after I'm done with step one. You've seen the last few streams I've done that. I got it to work, and then I'm like, okay, I have some extra time. Let me go refactor to make it easier to read, right? And then even rare, more rarely, because you only really need to do this if you have an issue with performance, is if, if, it, if you got it to work and it looks nice, but it's still too slow, you're probably going to want to do some optimization, right, to improve the performance. Yeah. So... Um, that, I try to, when I try to mentor people, I try to tell them the same thing. Don't prematurely optimize. That's the last step. Don't do the last step first. The first step is just make it work. Um, especially in test-driven development, you start with tests, right? You um, get the test to pass. That's your number one goal, right? So that in, it involves understanding the requirements, getting an implementation that gives you a passing test. 
then, I mean, not stress, not stress out about it being maintainable or readable or idiomatic, just get it to work. And then, um, you'll get, it, it's a building of successive layers of confidence, right? You're confident that it works. Now let's make it so other people can read it, <laughs> that you can read it yourself after a week and that, you know, it passes code reviews. It looks nice. That's, you know, about making things idiomatic, etc. So, um, that, um, once you've done that, now you are now you're confident that not only does your code work, but it looks good. Then you can worry about is it fast enough? Now, of course, this all gets tweaked a little bit because uh, in certain circumstances. Because what if your requirement is that it be fast, right? What if this is you're given the re the requirement that not only does you have to have the web page look nice, but it has to load within ten milliseconds. Well, then it shuffles things around, and you you might have to break this up into multiple iterations where. Um, being fast is actually one of your requirements, so you have to combine some aspects of step three into step one, and that's fine. What you'll end up doing is your test will involve performance. And so it, it couples working and being fast together. Um, but in general, when, when it's a more relaxed set of requirements, performance is last, maintainability and readability is a little bit more important than that, and having it work is the most important. <laughs> So you get fast as you cheat at optimizing the other day. What does that mean to cheat at optimizing? Because optimization doesn't require following rules. In fact, optimizing usually involves breaking rules to make it fast. <laughs> That's why everyone needs code biscuits. Aha! Uh -huh. Hashtag ad. <laughs> How are you doing, code spin? You guys don't know code biscuits. Shout out to CM Griffin. Not only did he make the chat overlay above my head, he also made a plug-in to Visual Studio Code and other editors, I'm assuming, to um, give you code biscuits. If you don't know what code biscuits are, please look it up. And that's my ad for Chris's stream. Code spends a walking advertisement? I suppose so. I mean, code is in your name, right? I'm doing all right. How are you doing? Okay, that worked except for, I think I wanted it, like, if I refresh, to still show that. So I kind of want to force showing it if a key exists. I think I'm going to do that in the, uh, I'm going to change the nature of that flag. This is, uh, the one in, um, in the props, right? Show admin key input. I think it should be, like... Expose admin key input. Well, no. How about force sh force admin key input? That'd be more appropriate, right? Because we we want to show it if we have it in order to like drop it. Um, but if not, it's like well, we would we wouldn't want to show it unless somehow we're forced to, and that's that's through the URL. This is the query parameter. So let's make that force so that the implication is stronger. And then that feeds back up to the top level, so this becomes force. And so I need to rename it here. All right, alphabetically that fits there, right? Okay, so where is that used? Okay, here. Similar rename. Right, so this is now more correct, right? If the search starts with admin, we want to force the admin key input to be shown. Yes. Okay, so now that now that semantic being changed slightly, in here it should be like, let show for, uh, admin key input equals self admin key is sum or that we're told to force it. Now this gets reduced to that. So it's like decide if we should show it or not. Depending on do we have one already or are we supposed or we're forced to show the input. If we're going to show it, then if we have a key, you can either forget it or use it to log in. Otherwise, so uh, another thing is this input is no longer correct, right? It should be like admin key tools or something. Show admin key tools, right? Because the tools are either a couple buttons or an input. 
which means that this I should I should have picked a better name for. Let me fix that. Um, this should be force admin key tools. So should this. And then down here as well. Names are important to me these days because when I come back and read my code later, I um, want to I want the names to help me r remember or learn if I didn't already know the um, intent tools. Should I have McKee UI? Yeah, I, I think of tools and UI as being the same thing in the context of the front end. But that's just me. And hello there, random. Randomer? Hi. Okay, so what's the cheating then that Iwakal was talking about? You couldn't get the benchmark under the magic 10 millisecond line, so you clocked up your RAM instead. You consider that cheating. What, well, it depends on what you mean by magic 10 millisecond line. Because if it was part of the requirements you got from the customer, then they probably not just said 10 milliseconds, but they said 10 milliseconds on, and then they specified like what the computing resources were. Then, then I think you cheated. <laughs> but if they just made it in an arbitrary 10 milliseconds, I don't think it's cheating to... You do what you can to make it run fast enough. That means clocking your RAM. Why not, right? <laughs> Thank you for the follow, by the way. Is activity a state machine? Activity is an enumeration of variants in UI state. So I guess you can say yes. Yes. Activity is a state machine. There are four states. Loading, logging in, playing, and sitting outside. So, the, so I don't know if this is the best way to implement it, but what I did was I have um, in the view, I just say um, activity. And activity depends on this, that variant. So there's your state machine. It's current activity. Um, depending on what the state is, we load a different component, possibly with different props. So, so I think the answer is yes. There's no customer. You just decide you want. Well, then you're setting your own requirements. You can't be cheating. <laughs> so yeah, again, randomer. This might not be, um, or infinite. This might not be the best way to do it. But that's that's the level at which I've I've gotten yet uh, so far. All right, so um, I was going to test this, right? Um, this might be the refresh problem with Webpack. If Webpack was okay, yeah, so we need to restart Webpack. One of these days, I'll figure out why it, that happens. I found that I just have to restart Webpack and then things go start working again. All right, so we didn't say admin. But we had a key, so now we can forget it. It goes away. Which is what I want, right? If I really wanted to, to get it, I would put admin there. Reload, it should disappear. Admin. Choose the file. Forget it or log in. Okay, I think I like that. Reload. It's there by default because we have the key. Forget the key. Okay, good. This is exactly the, the way I want. I'm setting my own requirements, and that's how I want that to look. The only thing I might change is the, the look of the input. But that's kind of a refactoring step, right? The, uh, the appearance. It's functional right now, even if the appearance is not optimal. So this would be... Um, add ability to forget admin key. Essentially, right? Unless I should talk about the other stuff that I did. That's what I was working on. Oh, no, I also pulled in that. Yeah, so there are two things here. Add ability for reget admin key. Always show admin key tools if we have an admin key. So this, uh, the summary of those two would be something like, I accidentally did two things at once. Sorry, don't, don't shame me too much. I will promise to do, have two different commits in the future. Just kidding. I'm going to say something like, uh, improve admin key UI. 
Because that's what a manager would say. <laughs> All that markup has to go somewhere eventually, though. Hold on, I missed something. This part of the code looks much better than two screens of raw HTML with if statements. You probably meant the top level lib, right? Yeah. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I separated the UI into these, because these are essentially different modes of the application. So it makes the top level a lot easier to understand. The top level, the only thing common to all activities is that you have it inside of a viewport, which is essentially means I don't have any scroll bars. That was a design decision. I didn't want scroll bars. If you can't fit, you just make your screen bigger. That's just my decision. I might regret that, but yeah, that's the only thing common. And then everything else is depending on activity. And some of these activities are ridiculously simple right now. Loading just says loading, right? The most sophisticated one is going to be the playing screen because now we have to generate a uh, canvas to draw the WebGL in and we're going to have a much more elaborate UI because like if you've seen in the real production system, there are all these uh, different tabs, control tabs that you can go to. More if you're the admin administrator, right? So each one of these is going to be its own component and this tab selector will pick that and then we'll have a WebGL canvas, and then we'll have the chat window here. Hi, chat. And uh, that's all the playing activity. It's going to be the most complicated one. Oh, no. Uh, well, Fanat, I, I've uh, been burned in the past by having horrible commit messages, so I try really hard to put something in there that I always think to myself, will I be happy six months from now when I look back at this commit Will I understand what I did? I'm like, if I just write worked on stuff, I'm not going to be happy later. <laughs> your commit message is equal to your Jira task. Yeah, if you have a rigid structure where every work item has to be like under a Jira task, then you can take advantage of, like you could just put the Jira ticket number in the commit. And then when someone reads the log later, they see number one, two, three, four. And they're like, okay, let me go open that Jira ticket. And then you get the, that actually lets you um, leverage Jira and type less in your commit message. Cause you probably already written up the work item and what you did in the Jira ticket. So why be redundant in the Git unless you think maybe in the, in the future they'll be severed and you won't have the Jira anymore and you'll want the commit messages. So it depends on your situation. But in, the, in one of my jobs I had, we didn't bother putting a lot in the commit because we knew it was always going to be tied to a, a, a JIRA system or something like that. Also, if you're being SOC compliant. Oh, so it's a requirement. What's SOC? I know SOC is system on chip, but you probably mean, mean a different SOC. I just dropped 53 frames. I was saying, like, the SOC I know is probably different. Sarbane Oxley? Okay, so it's like a, a set of sta ri more rigid standards. Yeah. Sure. It, and I'd also have, yeah, yeah, it depends, right? Different requirements. Um, let me move on. It's a good habit to get into to write more better git commits messages anyway. Um, but it takes discipline. Sometimes when I get lazy, I get lax with that too. All right, next uh, work item. Connect to, oh, this is going to be the hard one that's multi-step. This is left over from yesterday, too. So now that we have a separation of loading the key and logging in, when we hit login, we're supposed to figure out who we're going to connect to. Try connecting uh, right away when the, actually, it should say establish connections to servers when a playing activity starts. Have the server tell client, right, so this I need to add because I need to kind of tell the difference between the server disconnecting because we had the bad key or the server disconnecting because of some transient failure, meaning we want to try to reconnect. If they tell us we have a bad key, it's pointless to reconnect, right? So if we get a re indication of a bad key, we should not uh, reattempt a com uh, connection. But if not, we would we want to reconnect because we'll occasionally get a, a a uh, network failure we'll want to reconnect right so first would be c constructing a collection so we have that in here i just need to extract the information we need from this and then add to it the state that we need so for every combination of local ho uh, of a host and port we're going to want to have a 
storage for a connection object or WebSocket, I guess. So let's add that. Uh, in place of what we have now, which is, I think, just a single WebSocket. So we'll kind of we'll want to have a collection in which we can have multiple servers. So I'm thinking that we're going to need to have a, a, um, a, some kind of collection where the key is based off of, I suppose it would be server number. Do we get that? I don't even think I get server number. I forget what we actually get. Do I have a copy of that file? I think I can get it if I go to omniarenia.com slash client. I forget it. Was it client, just client config.json? Yeah. So it's just host and port. Okay, so that's all I have. So maybe I don't need to have a key. I can just have a vector. Right? It'll be a vector of uh, something. Message. So I suppose I'll put it here. Yeah. I still haven't settled on what style I want to keep as far as ordering structs or and when do I divide them into separate modules and all that. Do you think about progressive HTML response? You mean open a socket to push the HTML with little chunks so you could prepare it in parallel? I have support for that in the HTML code I wrote, the uh, chunked encoding, but I haven't used it because instead I use WebSockets, and there I just try to make sure that each message the WebSocket transmits is uh, small enough. If it's a really large message, I'll try to break it up. Usually, like, go to the core of why is it large. It might be large because you asked to retrieve all tickets in the ticketing system, so I might separate that into one message per ticket so, I, so I, in other words, I'm, what I'm, I, the long story short is I tried to divide messages at a higher level than HTML so that my HTML responses are always short. If I was forced to handle a large HTML response that I couldn't break up at a higher level, I would probably do something like chunked encoding. You don't think U.S. support for that kind of streaming yet? Well, U is just a wrapper on top of the web APIs, right? So they just give you a fetch service. So you might be, so you're probably right that their fetch service doesn't expose all of the API required for streaming. Yeah. You can make the system by your own. That's fun. Yeah, that's what I've been doing in the back end. The front end, I'm not as interested in it. Also, it's kind of also fun to learn other people's frameworks. But for the back end, definitely, I'm going to be doing everything my own uh, that I care about. I don't care about encryption or compression because... I'm more interested in the game design, the networking, and um, and that kind of thing. I thought TCP could handle splitting packets. Well, it depends on what else you're doing. So if you're using a single TCP connection for many different channels, like a multiplex layer on top of TCP, then sure, TCP splitting the packet works for works for, for works for a large packet but it doesn't help you if you need to multiplex large messages at the at the layer above you doesn't have server side rendering oh okay so then um that would explain why it doesn't isn't maybe concerned about streaming because it doesn't need to render it doesn't need to send it from the server yeah it's all it's mostly right yeah mostly done on the client side but you could have elements that are still large. Like I'm thinking about the content that goes over the WebSocket between my client and server. I could have large messages. That's why I need to be concerned about splitting them if they get too large. Otherwise, if you're sending a large message, nothing else can get through, right? If the message channel is being used by many different things in a multiplex situation, you're going to stall every other user of it, right? HMR is the way to go? Hmm. Never fear, Imperi is here. Welcome, Imperi. How are you today? And then Jelmika is also here. Getting used to your new keyboard. It's going quite slowly since you're also trying to get used to home road typing. Ah, yes. You have the Moonlander, right? That's I've heard from everyone who got the Moonlander that it's almost like starting over lear learning typing. Does Rust have support for WebSockets instead of using a crate? 
It depends, randomer. There are different contexts. So if you're in the back end, it is a crate that you're going to want to look for. It's not in the standard library. The popular crates are tungstenite. And uh, it's derivatives. That's back end stuff. Front end, the web sys wrappers, they're bindings for all web um, APIs generated from WebIDL. Part of web sys is uh, the, uh, web, the web socket API that's in, um, well, it's one of the web APIs. So you'll see it here somewhere, web socket, right? You also see other cool things like WebGL. Yeah, but WebSocket from WebSys is what you'll use in the front end if you're going to put it in a browser. And you provides a service abstraction layer on top of that. So if I, sh if I go to, to you and I search for WebSocket service, that's um, really just a convenience on top of WebSys to, um, to set up the, um, to, to basically adapt the WebSocket to the uh, callback mechanism in you. But yeah, see, it depends on your um, where you're going to put the rust. For me, I'm not even using tungstenite in the back end. I made my own WebSocket crate because, like I said before, for back end stuff, I really enjoy making stuff from scratch if it's stuff I care about. Yeah, tungstenite. There you go. All right. So, or, or in in the not so distant future, maybe you'll consider my crate too. I made my own WebSocket crate. <laughs> It's in it's in Git, but it's not published to crate does crate.io yet. What's this? That must be new. Uh, Git uh, GitHub dot com slash Rhymo eight three five four slash web sockets. So the, there is a working both C plus plus and Rust um, Implementation of WebSocket protocol. I just haven't published it through crates.io yet. Um, if you need something that's published and supported, you t use Tungstenite, of course. And I won't feel that sad that you don't use my code. Only just a little bit sad. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to do what now? Yeah, I want to have a structure that represents all the state we have associated with this particular server. So might as well call that server. And well, Realm server, to be specific, because we might have other servers like Twitch, and in here, it doesn't need to be, doesn't need to be pub yet because it's only used internally. We would have a host, any port, and the WebSocket, and that's what we're migrating this to. So this should be uh, Realm servers as the vector of that. There we go. That's what I want. Moonlander. It's even more annoying when you're not used to home row typing. Yeah, so you're both learning different key layout, different or, um, spatial organization of the keys, and also the uh, the layering, right? So I've heard that there's a lot of cognitive load there, and so it's it feels like you're going back to not knowing how to type. And some people I know have just given up on it and gone back. <laughs> but if you can stick with it and it works for you, I've heard that it can be really nice ergonomically and... In terms of t efficiency, you can type faster with it, but yeah, everyone's different. Okay, so this will cause compiler errors. This is compiler error-driven development. Right, so we don't want to hard code this and store one of them. So the, all of this is going to go. I think I would want to rename this to start connecting to server and maybe provide the... Um, the server index, maybe? Actually, it depends on the context. What if I just comment it out for now? Okay, yeah, we don't have a WebSocket to begin with, but we do have um, Realm servers, which is empty at, at first, right? This is in the wrong order. I need to fix that. L comes from 4P. L comes before P. Quitting is for quitters. That's true. <laughs> Couldn't get used to pressing backspace with your thumbs. I wouldn't be able to get used to that either. That's odd. It's taken me a while to get used to using both thumbs to delete. 
That's what I do now because my left thumb is now the layer flip, like the toggle for layer. So when I um, I'm holding down my left thumb on the left shift, now I goes up, K goes down, J goes left, L goes right. It's very similar to VI actually or Vim. And when I release the left thumb, now they're characters again. And uh, your shift or left thumb shift N is undo. So that allows me to not have to reach for um, the arrow keys or backspace or any of that. And like left thumb shift left is to go, um, is to select. And then shift and control is to go by words instead of characters. And then just control is to, is without, so it took me a while to get used to that. But that's all my my own fault because that's what I decided to do. This I'm using a Freestyle Pro from Kinesis and uh, it's very configurable. Okay, I'm gonna have to adapt these because things like auth response ready, we need to know what server it goes with, right? You know what I'd like to do. Now that I think about it, because I need to know where to go back into our collection, and our collection could change. I think what I'd like to do is not use a vector here, but actually have a collection with unique keys that are just arbitrary. I've done this before, so you like have a hash map from uh, just use size, it doesn't matter. And um, we would then have like next a next realm server key. It's the use size as well. And we just like kind of dole them out. Um, we mint them from this. Every time we add a server, we just take the next one and use it as the key. And the keys are just arbitrary. And they're only used to um, associate back to the collection in these messages. So like this would in need to be more elaborate. This is um, response and um, this would be um, realm server key. So it knows which server connection that goes with right and then these two these would be the keys right closed and opened and um when it gets to be more than one argument here i like to make them uh into a structure with names so this would be message and uh key that's what i that's what i think i want to do hash map is a standard collection Muscle memory soon stops that. Yeah, for me, I'm getting older, and so muscle memory it takes longer to train. But it's still true. Gonna need some time to make your own layout for the Moonlander. Yeah, takes. Uh, what you want to probably do is do it iteratively. Try a an initial layout, and then you'll collect things that worked and what didn't work so well, and, you'll, and then you'll ref refine that until you get a layout that works for you. You have space, backspace, tab, and return on the thumb cluster. Interesting. Sounds good. So they're all like navigation and spacing related. Actually, that's not true. Backspace is not a spacing related. So it's like um, editor control as, far, as opposed to content. Easy thing would probably just stop making typos. There you go. Then they just rip out that backspace key. You don't need it anymore. Just never make a mistake. Okay, so this is going to be an issue too. Um, auth challenge comes from where? Oh, for handle server message, we'll need to know which server it is. So this should be like, we should already know the key. So then I can include it here. Response is um, signature. Right? Yes. Okay. Backspace counts as white space according to is ASCII white space. Yeah, it's just very rare for it to be in content. The only th case I 
I can think of right now off the top of my head is when you want to print a backspace to move the cursor as a side effect of writing to an output stream. Oh, U8 is ASCII white space? I see. Okay. So this should be connecting to servers, right? Actually, I'd rather just take this and move it into there, which I have commented out. Why did I do that? I didn't need to do that. Don't know what I was thinking. That there, move it to there. I, yeah, I think it's because it has a lot of compiler errors. Okay, so this is um. That. Right, so we need to have a way to turn the key into the WebSocket, which is just this. If mm, self dot realm servers dot uh, get. Do we need mutable access to it? I don't think we do actually. Send binary was not immutable, so we just use get. Um. Key would be realm server key. And then, uh, then map it, right? Server, well, let's use a full name realm server, realm server dot ws, um, address uh, borrow. If let some WebSocket equal that, then that. Oh, is that mutable? Uh, was it not map? Oh, no, it's not map. It's um, and then or something, right? Yeah. Uh, expected enum option found a reference to an option. Oh, right. I want to do, um, as ref, I think. Yeah. All these little things that this is, this is, we're talking about muscle memory. This is rust mus muscle memory. Knowing that, um, and then is how you take an optional something and turn it into an optional something else. And then the asref is how you turn an option, you turn a reference to an option of something into an option of a reference to something. <laughs> hey there, Red Rampage Crumpet. How are you today? Long time no see, as in no see me, right? Okay, so response is here, right? Okay, then this is done. Anyone know how to access a nested key on a CRD JSON value? I think you need to convert it to a map first, MetroDev, and then once it's a map, you can uh, index it. But I think there was a convenience method in there. If I'm not mistaken, uh, let's, let's look. I might remember where that is. Because a value, you're talking about a value, like it would call said, you have to check if it's an object. So you'd want to uh, do if let object, object if let object map equals a value. And then with map, I'm pretty sure you can um, index. But there might be a convenience method over all of that. JSON value might implement an indexer. Let's see. Value. The indexer is um, index, right? Yeah, so I think you can you can use this. Yeah, so you can do that. You can just index it with um, with a single index, and I think there's also a a a, a, um, a way to um, go deeper. 
it'll automatically do checking to see if it's an uh, object first for you. Yeah, the, uh, it would call correct. You can also do as object. But I think given any kind of, this, this data is going to be a JS value. It doesn't know, um, after it's been packaged in a JSON value, it doesn't remember that it's an object. So this indexing operation actually checks, if, if we looked at the source, it's probably making sure it's an object or something. Yeah, see, it does a match for you. Um, if it's an integer, it, ma it matches arrays. If it's a string, it matches objects. So it does this for you if you just use the indexer. But as far as, like, if you wanted to go multiple steps, I think there's a way. I just don't remember. I thought there was a convenience for that, too. Anybody happen to know? They might have it here in their example somewhere. Oh, that's there. There we go. You can just chain the indexers it's because um, it always gives you back the index. Always gives you back a JS value, and if it like didn't make sense, I think it's like a placeholder. So, it, if at any point along this chain, you um, it doesn't make sense, like maybe X doesn't exist, so this indexing YZ doesn't make sense, it just falls out and just gives you a null. So there you go. Someone's texting me. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's a reminder that I gotta be available for a call. In an hour and a half, I think. Actually, let me check. I might have to... I need to be conscious about when my meeting is, so I need to uh, check something real quick. 4.30. Okay, I gotta end... My hard stop today is 4.30 my time, which is an hour and a half from now. We like how result works. Yeah, um, and what's really, I, for me, really helped is to study this cheat sheet. Because they um, go over all the things you can do with options, all the things you can do with results. And there's some kind of obscure things like um, and then and map to, um, to make chains. It says value null. This is JSON, not JS. That's true. Are you talking about JavaScript? Is that, did I go off on a huge tangent? We meant, we started off talking about Serity JSON, right? Yeah, it's, it can get kind of confusing between JSON and JavaScript. Especially when we're talking about uh, uh, web, the WebAssembly stuff. That's fine, A squared. They're actually pretty similar, right? Um, but different, slightly different APIs. With Serity JSON, I think those convenience methods in the indexer is probably all that um, all that MetroDev needs, right? Just use the indexer. Let me know, MetroDev. Are you were using a get? Yeah, just use the indexer. See if it works. Yes, but JS value is specifically talking about the Rust. Um, I think it's JS sys wrapper for a javascript value which is different from json right so yeah when when we it be very specific with our names right a or maybe it's not js sys is it web sys or is it web wasm mind gen it's one of these one of these js oh yeah there it is so this is very specific it's the rust representation of an object owned by javascript so it's not JSON, it's really it's a handle to something that's managed in JavaScript engine. And JSON would be um, a structure which is used for serialization in Rust. In JavaScript, there's a little bit of gray area because a simple JavaScript object can be treated like JSON and it's sort of interchangeable. But yeah, that means something very specific. Result and option are monads. I don't understand monads completely, so I rely on the cheat sheet to show me that they can be chained with, I believe these are what you're talking about, right? The, um, these operators that allow you to um, form a chain to do things functionally. And then a map would be the most important features if Rust didn't have the question mark. Yeah, the question mark operator is syntactic sugar for early return on the 
variant none for option and error for result, right? Do you know how the memory layout of JS objects is? It's wild. I'm sure it's wild. JavaScript is notoriously wild about a lot of things. That's okay. They can be wild. <laughs> Maybe they're born for it. Okay. Um, born to be it, I should say. So this is um, Realm Server Key. Hey, it's an opportunity to, for me to not do a take here, right? It's the same thing here. If some realm server is to get that mutably, then realm server dot ws equals none instead of take. Same thing here. So this should say, be authenticating as admin to something colon something, right? Because of this, it will be realm server dot host realm server dot port. And then um, Oh, I suppose I need both of these. So I need to, I need this more uh, complete version, right? Yes, I need this. Oh, actually I want that too. Interesting. How am I going to handle this? Because I don't have those available to me. I guess what I want to do is combine these, right? Into a tuple and say this. Well, let me do that or am I going to have a multi-borrow thing? Uh... I thought that's what and then would do. Oh, it's this whole right, um, shoot. Yeah. I should say if it is something, then return it, otherwise, none, right? Yeah. If let some websocket equal this, else none. No. Okay. Let me write it this way first, because I'm my brain is starting to hurt. If then this some that otherwise that. Now let the, uh, there should be an e easier way to do that, right? With a map or something? Maybe not. Maybe I have to keep it like that. So now it, now it works. I don't just don't know if that's optimal. Let me catch up in chat, because I hear the ding saying people are typing. No need for a fat pointer, but it also means that JavaScript can't handle more than a certain address space. Yeah, it's limited to its space of its engine, right? Need to return a function, uh, op option rather. You could use question mark here. Some, I'm not that comfortable using question mark up here operator with option, but I think you're right, right? It short circuits it early, so it would, yeah. I think I think I know what you're saying. So it would be um, instead of the if, it would be realm. Actually, um, this sum is not even correct, right? And then already returns an option. It takes a function which, oh right, it just passes. So I do need the sum. So I need to, I do need to say sum realm server. But you're right, I can say realm server dot ws question mark right. 
Now that's now we're getting exotic. <laughs> I can I can I can almost guarantee someone who is just learning Rust is going to be like, "What the heck does that question mark do?" <laughs> and I'd have to explain that question mark basically unrolls to that, right? It first tests to see if it's something, and if so, it actually returns the thing we're constructing. Otherwise, it short circuits to none, right? All all fold into that. Since you're already ever changing the inner type, map might be better. Map turns option into option and leaves none, a uh, none in place. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. I uh, the I had the end then before because there was an inner option, right? Uh, but you're right. I could probably turn this into a map. Then I don't need the sum, right? But I'd still have the question mark, right? Or would I? Do I need the and then because of this inner... I still need the and then because this can short circuit return, doing a none return, even if the input wasn't none. Yeah. That's, that's why, it, that's where it gets really tricky. <laughs> am I, am I, am I sufficiently squeezing your brains? <laughs> See, I, uh, I'm starting to get it, but not completely, right? It's like maybe we do need map there. Oh, but then oh, but then we can't use map because we could start with something. If you start with something but end with nothing, you can't use and then. It has uh, you can't use map. It map is always something to something, nothing to nothing. This is where we go from something possibly to nothing. Yeah. And those things are like part of the muscle memory you get when um, over time when you're using these, you you end up picking the right one eventually. But it, at the at at first you don't know anything, and then you, someone gives you this cheat sheet, and you're like, okay, I see map turn something into something, right? And I see that and then turn something into maybe something, but maybe not. But both of you end up you get an option as an output, right? So they're close. The distinction being what we just went over, right? That you might turn something into nothing. And, and that subtlety is like not is not uh, obvious at, front, at 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 the start. And then as a flat map, it takes some t and optionally makes it a u or none. Think of list map and list flat map. Flat map isn't even in this list. Flat map only shows up for iterators. Is, is there a flat map for option, and it's just not in the cheat sheet? Flat map. Yeah, I think you're thinking of iterator. Oh, you you said list. Yeah. Well, technically, it's the iterator that you get from list. Sure. Yeah. For if we're if we're considering um, the difference in iterator map versus flat map, right? Again, it's something to something or something into. Um, an iterator and that might give you an option out, right? Or it might give you nothing out. I might be a little stretching a little bit. <laughs> yeah. I can tell I'm not quite there. I'm still learning this stuff. Okay, um, the WebSocket message has a message, but also has a key in it now. All righty. Right, so here's where we get to p pass the uh, key along to handle the message. Getting there, you know, one step at a time here. Right, this is no longer a vector, it's a hash map. And we need to have the initial next... Uh, um, I, don't, I, I like starting at 1 because I like to reserve 0 to mean like an invalid key. But that's just because I'm old school. With the Rust way, I really should start with zero, and if I wanted an invalid key, I would use an option. Thank you for that follow. I appreciate it. The iterator one gets flattened, yeah. Okay, we're getting there. So I just need to update this start connecting. Right, so this changes because we actually need to fill the map first. And this can be called more than once because our client configuration could theoretically change. So we can't assume that the map is empty. We have to assume that the map might have stuff in it. 
So we'll have to find like which ones are we adding and which ones are we updating, which ones are we're removing, right? So there's there's three steps to this then. We can just go through all of the yeah. But we can we can do the add and update just by iterating through all the all the ones that we have. Actually, I don't even know if this component has the client configuration. We might need to give it to it. It doesn't have it. So I suppose we'll just share with it the client configuration. We might as well use a reference counted thing, right? Actually, cloning, it's not too not big a deal. ENV. Oh, no, it's not ENV. Uh, ENV was something else. Where did I put the client configuration? Here it was. Okay, so there just is a client configuration. All right. That needs to be imported. It needs to be clonable. We can make it clonable. All right, and then... Let me fix this little br the thing that breaks at the above layer here. Oh, that fi that um, this filters down to the all the types that we use, right? So this also has to be clonable. All right, and then where we use it, that prop is missing now. So what I prefer here is to indent and indent again for the attributes, and then end with the end tag, and then outdent all the way. But that's just me. So, the new prop is client configuration. There. Oh, we have to have a client configuration. So, we should have one. We won't get to the playing state without it, right? It'll stay in the loading state with it. So, I think we can assume here we have it and just say... Um, as ref unwrap clone there might be a, a more compact way of doing that thing is that this is an option right so what this is doing is getting a um, option reference and then unwrapping that to get a reference and then using that reference to clone it because we're not moving out the client configuration. I just want to borrow it. Is it is it just borrow? No. Ultimately, we need to unwrap. Oh, hello, bug. A bug landed on me. It looks like a little small, like a ladybug, only smaller. Goodbye. <laughs> Bugs landing on me, not just on the my, in my code, but in real life. Ah. Okay. Client configuration. We have it now. So with that client configuration here, we can say a for server in self.props.clientconfiguration.servers. And so this will be a server info. So it has a host and a port number. Great. So then um, we'll have to see, do we have a record for that server and port already? If not, we have to add one. Otherwise, we use an existing one. So I'd rather make this a separate function. Like find or add that gives us a map entry. Let me write this that first. So uh, function... Um, Server entry, I guess. Mute self gives us back a hash map. Uh, What's well, the standard collections? Hash map. Is it hash underscore map? Entry of server, which I'd rather abbreviate to just hash map if I can. All right, and then that should. Uh, oh, we need. Um, Host T where 
T is as ref slice. And then um, port is a U16. So it's just surprising it doesn't behave like flat map on arrays. Oh, wait a minute. I missed some stuff. You were shocked and appalled to discover that RxJS's implementation of flat map doesn't preserve order. It mixes the inner values in whatever order. Ooh. Ooh. Why would they do that? <laughs> I guess they assume that, hey, if you're flattening the structure, you didn't care about the structure, right? So I can just kind of jumble it all in a bag and shake it up and give you the stuff in whatever order I, I care about. Each of them returning values. And they, it just must be uh, some kind of um, simplification of, like, because they didn't have a requirement of pr order preservation, they're like, eh, let's just fill a hash table with everything that we get when we flatten. Why not? And then iterate the hash table in order, in or arbitrary order. Ultimately, I want to iterate, right? Then how do we get an entry? We don't, actually. I think I need to do this a little bit differently. I need to say um, that it's... Uh, just server. And then have it return a mutable reference to a server. Realm server. Yeah, because we're going to now um, iterate. For... Is if I find it, I want to just return it. Otherwise, I want to get a new one with a mutable reference and return that, right? So... Uh, Self dot realm servers. Why does it say it's a tuple? Oh, right. Because we want, it's like you might want to have a reference to the key. Yeah, and I'll end up not needing that, right? Actually, maybe we do need the key. I might need the key, so I might want to return use size. Yeah, okay, so if. server dot um that's a isn't that a tuple can i say okay one dot host equals host and server one dot port equals port return server can't i say that oh I can once I say let host equals host as ref. Yes, I can do that. Okay, so if we fall through, that means we're going to want to add a new one. So let realm server ID, uh, did I call it ID? Uh, key. Self dot next dot well, just that and then add one to it. Okay, and then um, self.realmservers.insert Actually, I want an entry, don't I? The key is the key dot or it's got to be an easier way to do this because it's always going to try to look it up and it won't find it. It shouldn't find it. 
I should be able, if I do insert, I'll have to fetch it again. Is it, there's got to be a better way to do this. <laughs> Hash map. What I want to do is insert something and, and, but hold on to a mutable reference to it. You wish all the observable stuff was built into ECMA script just so that all JS devs are forced to learn it? You actually spent today cleaning up other people's subscriptions. Just don't let them pile up. <laughs> so yeah, insert gives me the old. The, if it's present, I'll get a reference to it. If it did not, none is returned. That's not what I want. I want to insert and retain a mutable reference. What, what does get mute do? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, Sarian, but then the entry also does a search, which I don't need, right? It'll never be occupied by my design. It'll always be vacant. So it seems silly to do a search and, and then to have an or insert, right? I kind of want to say that this will always be an insert and give me back immutable reference to the value. I guess it's as good as we're going to get, right? So entry or insert. The default would be a realm server with the host as owned or to owned. And the port is just copied. And then um, that's just returned, right? Uh, maybe not. Oh, it wants a tuple. Oh, no, I need to make it into a tuple. Right, so... Um, I really don't want that. Can I just turn... Yeah. I want it to be copied, so... What if I just do... Um, I can give them names here too. Realm server key, comma, comma server, and put an and in front of there, and I can just say this, and then get rid of the dot ones. Well, thank you for the follow, by the way. I think the entry API only does the hashing once. Well, then I guess it's not that bad. Reactivity without observables. Check out Elm, and. Uh, Seed is supposed to be closer to Elm also. So yeah, I'm, I'm one step away here. I just need to do key comma that. And that needs to be a function call. And the WebSocket, we don't have one yet. There we go. That's it. Hey there, Rally Monkey. How are you doing? I for forgot to say hi to Sarian, too. Oh, and the Epic Unknown. Hello. How are you doing? I missed Stu Squared and Sir Flabbergast. I'm sorry I missed you guys. Waves. Just wish there was a way to use the entry API without having to use an owned value. Do you mean uh, this key here? They they have a reason for doing that, right? The key has to be owned because it... it um... Oh, I see what you're saying. I was going to say it needs to be owned because it inserts it, but it doesn't, right? It only inserts it if you do or insert. The alternative would be it would borrow it here, but then you'd have to give it the owned value here somehow, right? That would be the alternative. They, they, I guess they're, they're, what they're expecting this to be used in is like, if it's not in the map, you're about to insert it, so might as well give you the owned key right away. Yeah. Redux and Redux is very close to Elm. There's Udux. I need to look, I still need to look into that, right? That's like a Redux-like library for you. 
I haven't looked into this yet, but this is supposedly uh, Redux for you. Shared state containers for you applications. Yeah, and there's a reducer. It looks pretty familiar. I haven't looked into this yet, but I've, I've been told that that's what I might want to look at if I want a Redux-like thing. F sharp is the functional .NET language, right? I only know that's all I know about F sharp. <laughs> Obviously, OCaml, yeah. The only thing I know about OCaml is that Rust borrowed, i.e., stole a lot of ideas from OCaml. All right. Um. So, does this make sense to read it? Ref, get a ref to the string. Look through all the Realm servers. It, um, we're not going to be doing this often, right? This is only if we don't know if we have a record for the host. We have to um, search through the collection um, from end to end. If we find it, get a return its reference with a copy of the key. If not, if we fall through, then we're going to manufacture a new key and then insert a new entry returning both the key and the reference to the entry so it's a give this is a convenience method really it says whether you have a record or not give me the existing record a reference to it or, or insert an empty one based off of the po host port and that it's given so that i can now do this i can say for server in servers uh let realm server key and well, this should be like server info, really. Server equals self dot realm server server info dot host server info dot port. And then with that, I can say start connecting to that server, right? And this is where I imagine I'm going to want to pass the key. Or I can just directly put this code into here. Because essentially what we're going to do is take that host and port and form a WSS link and using the um, Realm Server key to form the argument to these guys, which are missing right now. And... Yes, yeah, so here I don't actually don't need the server. Well, I, I had... I wanted that reference just in case I needed it. So this would just be here, use the key again. Actually, no, I do want it because, yeah, so I do want it. So I basically want to pass both of these to it. There. So this takes self, but it also takes, am I going to have, a, I'm going to have a trouble with a multibar, aren't I? <laughs> we can't mutably borrow self and mutably borrow something that's in self so this is going to be a problem but let me just keep going because conceptually this is what I want mutable reference to a realm server I'm probably going to have to relook up by the key right it actually didn't complain to me about that that's interesting probably because I have other compiler errors what if I comment those out for now I want to see the multi-borrow error yeah, there it is, right? Cannot move, oh, right, mute. There's that, not that. Okay, yeah, reference. I think there it is. Yep, multi-borrow problem. If I comment that out, the multi-borrow problem goes away, right? No, there's still a multi-borrow problem. Okay, so there's two multi-borrow problems. <laughs> Oh, because I'm calling self. I can't do that. Yeah. Okay. So then... Um, I really can't hold on to this server. Yeah. I thought I could, but I'm missing a lot of chat. Okay, see you, Dr. Padawan. You built a small library to give you union types and TypeScript? That's pretty cool. 
Evening, Apollo Eye. How are you? How's your game going, Apollo Eye? Collect and then iterate over the server. That's what I was thinking. Just collect the keys together and then iterate over them. That's okay, you would call. I just need to keep an eye on chat to because sometimes the people like will say good night, like Doctor Padawan did, and Apollo I said hello, and it's intermixed with the other chat. So I just need to make sure I don't miss anything. Yeah, I think you're right, um, A squared. So that means I um I probably won't need this to return. I'll just keep it the way it is, and I'll just collect. I'll just say, um, really, it's going to either insert or, or or get the keys for all our servers, right? So, realm server keys equal this dot um, iter mute dot map. I suppose this to um, wait. No, it's not iter mute. Yeah, why am I doing mute, iter mute? Just iter. And these are, this is server info. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> And then I just want to return the dot zero for now. This is going to move down later. Okay. Uh, dot collect into a vector of whatevers. Mm, what? 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 I need to take a drink. Closure requires unique access to self. Probably because this returns a... takes a mutable reference, right? So, this is a problem. Do I need to get the server infos out first, then go back and iterate them again? That's what A squared, that's what you just said, right? Yeah. So another step then. Server infos. Or really it's then just cloning them, right? And then let realm server IDs equal server infos. Yeah, there you go. And then um, I'm not borrowing self until I get to here. Actually, um, then I can go back to doing a for loop, right? And I can just say uh, for realm server, well, for, mm, 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 no. Yeah, for, um, realm server key, ser realm uh, server in that iter, when I don't need the iter. No, I do need a map. Iter map to uh Oh no, I can't because you can't have more than one mutable reference. Actually it's okay, isn't it? Let's see. This is where my expertise of uh 
rust kind of falls off, right? Oh, not the dot zero. I want both of them, please. Yeah, we still have a borrow problem, right? It's because I've captured self mutably. That's the problem. Yeah, I'm just a little slow, A squared. <laughs> Yeah, it's the ref the reference to self is what it captured, right? So, um Yeah. Getting tired. Need a break soon. So, another la another round of collection then. Yes. So, once we have that, then I got to do four um Realm server. It's not IDs, it's keys. It's another sign that I'm getting tired. So we'll just have it uh, do a lookup again. So this will have to look it up again. Which makes sense because it's borrowing all of self, so we'll have to do it that way. Um, if let some server I keep vacillating between server and realm server I'll, I'll, when I refactor I'll fix I'll figure that out um, self dot realm servers dot get mute um, realm server key Borrow. Turn off inlay hints and let's just move all this code in there. And uncomment it. Save to format. Okay, so then um, WebSocket needs what? The key and the message. So this turns back into message because I need to capture the key here by copy. So realm server key message. I'm surprised it didn't have a, it didn't break on opened. But both opened and closed should require that I give a realm server key. Okay, and then this is server dot. Yeah. I okay, broke it a bunch of other places. What's this? Uh, oh, I don't need to borrow that. We can do a move. Same thing here, probably, right? Yeah, we can we can copy the realm server key. That's fine. All right. That's good, but now we broke we broke a bunch of other places. What's wrong here? Say what now? Why is that? The first bar occurs on line ninety six. I don't get it. <laughs> Why would this be a problem? Do I just need to be explicit about the lifetime? Nope. Yeah, I want to borrow it for A1. Why wouldn't it let me do that? First borrow occurs in line 96. Yes, but I don't need... I can drop the borrow after that. I, I'm confused. Okay, let me punt on that for a second. What's wrong here? Uh, same thing. We can copy the key in. And then down here, uh, mute. So that means this needs to be get mutable. OK. 
cannot borrow it as oh uh as mute all oh, right we don't change it we mutably ref reference it okay got it <laughs> Um, I wanted to borrow, right? Mutably. Hold on. This syntax might be a little clumsy here. Oh, thank you for that follow. Actually, it's not that, it's um, as mute here, I think. No? Ah, uh, because it's not mutable, because I have to do get mute. Wait, what? Isn't this a mutable reference? And... Oh, is it just, why does it say borrow of moved value? Oh, it's moved here. Yeah, okay, so then what am I doing here? I guess I just want to um, borrow the host and the port, not the whole thing, right? Borrow the host, copy the port, So this is um, host port, host port. Yeah. Drop server, I mean at the top there? Yeah. I'm, I'm confused why it... Um... What, I guess I can ask Clippy, what am I... Um... Okay. Cargo. Actually, I haven't done Clippy on the front end at all yet. I don't know if this will work. I suppose it will, right? Because it um, it's not actually needs to compile it for the platform. It's just analyzing it. Okay, let me go back and chat a little bit. Don't map here. Just doing the for loop, right? For key for... Yeah, that's what I did. So that yeah, we're talking about dropping the server or drop the beat and then jamp. <laughs> okay, first mutable is here, yes, but that's only for this for loop, right? Returning this value requires itself run server is borrow for A. I don't get it. Sure, I borrowed it here to return it there. What does that have to do with line 105? I think it's just here. We're not doing any uh, mapping or collecting here. Oh really? This this doesn't just terminate the borrow. It actually, even though we return here, it needs to be considered borrowed for the entire lifetime here. Then I have a problem, right? Okay, let me just back out of using because I am not actually using that second thing at all anyway. So let me just not do it, not return it, and I'll worry about that. I was just trying to make it easier for myself in the future, right? We'll just say Realm Server key and it just returns that now we don't have the silly lifetime um, to worry about and I'm just returning the key and uh, thank you for the follow 
and I'm just returning this at the end and relying on the side effect of this without a comma. Okay, and then this doesn't use a zero at the end. Uh, realm server key. Okay, there we go. That's private? Oh. Sure. Make it public, please. Where are we, actually? Oh, wait, why do I need to make it public there? Oh, because that's public. Yeah. All right. Fine, fine. Looks like we're down to warnings now. I don't need hash map. Ah, a lot of work. <laughs> Mrs. Silky Smooth, radio voice of Raimu? Well, now you can hear the exclusive voice of Raimu. <laughs> oh, no problem, LG, and um, have a good sleep. I have to call the stream soon because I have a hard cutoff coming up. Confirmed radio voice? Well, thank you, Dota 2 Attitude. Maybe if this programming thing doesn't work out, I can get a, a gig in radio somewhere. <laughs> All right. Is this ready to test? Am I printing out enough stuff? I should probably print out what we're connecting to here. Connecting to server... Mm, that. Server host, server port. Oh, we also should be forming that correctly. That, that's format. WSS colon slash slash host port. And it probably wants to borrow it, because it's a silly thing, so borrow it. Should I say, like, error connecting here? Why not, right? Server.host, server.port. WebSocket to, let's just put that everywhere. And all these places put this. Actually, this might be an issue. I might have to clone the server to do that. Yeah, I thought so. Okay, so um, let's give it a clone of the host. So let host equal, well, host. I hate the names because I, I, I'm making something that I intend to move into this closure. So I want to call it like host for closure or something, but that's such a clumsy name. I guess I can have it just be temporary. So server.host.clone and then immediately just mirror it back. Let host equal that. And then this is just uh, host and port. Oh, I'm going to have to do the same thing for the closure. Let port for closure equals server port. And then... Uh, okay. Oh. I put him in the wrong place. <laughs> it goes in the warning and not here. Why can't I move it out? Oh, because this might be called more than once. Um, well, let's just uh, borrow. Can I do that? No, because it's dropped. Okay, so... Um, hmm. But I can do this borrow, correct? Yes, I can. Nice. All right. So I feel like I'm getting better at Rust because I'm not getting stuck nearly as often. You can scope it all and shadow it. Can I? Ultimately, I, ha I have to pull it out of server because server um, has this that I don't want to move out, right? Um, so I want to separate these for 
the error messages or log messages separate them from net, which I don't want to move out or copy. It's just the names. Like, I don't want to call it... Or are you saying, like, to, to do that and then do a move? It always looks a little sketchy to me when I have um, just a, a scope there. But you're saying I can just do this, right? And then I don't need that. Actually, I still need to shadow the borrow, though. But yeah, you're right. I can just do that. Yeah, this always seems kind of dirty to me, though. It makes, when I'm looking at this and scanning it, it makes it look like this block belongs to that let. And if it weren't for this semicolon, it would almost, right? So this looks kind of sketchy to me. I almost want to, like, a do. If the, there was a keyword do, I would feel more comfortable. Right? Do that. But that, the bare block like that so it just seems kind of dirty. But maybe it's worth the price to have a name that obviously is within a scope here and it's intended to be moved into this closure. Sure, why not? I guess the other way, other thing I can do is make this into a function that yields a closure and just pass in server to it. That might be even cleaner. To find a do macro that does nothing? That's an idea. Just to satisfy my need for extra syntax. <laughs> hey there, pink fluffy llama. I'm not, my ego isn't that big that I need to make a, that I, that I need to invent my own syntax for my own comfort. Hey there, Fluxflu. Fluxflu. Add another new line between the last line and the scope that'll look a little better. I mean like that? I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't help me. I think I just leave that the way it is. Yeah, long time no see, Pink Fluffy Llama. Glad, glad you're here. Okay, I gotta manage my time now. I got hard cut off in 35 minutes, so I need to start wrapping up soon. Uh, what's wrong with notification here? Oh, shoot. Okay, so I need to export that. Not notification equal that. No semicolon. Semicolon there. See, just the, the, the fact that you can do that with Rust Syntax, it's goofy, but it actually just solved my problem about how I didn't like how that looked. And, and, uh, and, and it also solved the problem of this needing to escape the scope. Actually, quite elegantly. I like that. To not indent. Oh, this? Well, but my formatter rules are doing that, right? So... Sure, but the formatter rules are going to do that. It's just, it, I'm, I'm paying the price for my choices of the formatter rules. But yeah, this was, this was kind of a nice break, right? I need that out of, to escape the scope anyway. Okay, so, um, oh, thank you for that follow. This should work, right? It should enumerate all our servers. It should try to open a connection with all of them. Oh, what happens when it comes back? What are we, what are we doing there? I'm sorry, um, yeah, 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 WebSock, oh, oh, right, um, we store them back into the server collection there, right, the WebSocket, so then it, we just need to be able to make sure it finds it correctly in, when it processes the messages, yeah, in here, oh, thank you for that follow, I appreciate that. I guess it does right because um looks like we don't actually need to look up the websocket anymore oh no no we do we do it here yes okay i don't do the reconnect though but i that was a neck that was a future step right i just want to do this part actually i already did that part and i did this part too right so if I did it correctly, we've done the first two sub bullets and then maybe I'll do this and then call it a day for now. Let's see if it worked. Oh, sweet. I was expecting I'd have to restart Webpack. Load a key, please. So it should open three socket connections now. And yeah, it opened all three. Look at that. So on the back end, I should see all three uh, servers report a connection. Yeah, look at that. 
Don't you love it when things just work? So it does what I intended. It connects to all game servers and authenticates to all of them using the same private key. And manages, they're probably all going to get different challenge strings because they're randomly generated and it, it attract which one to answer with which response. So that's sweet. Let's check it in. I think I have just enough time to handle um, authentication failures and then I'll have to like go to my meeting. So uh, hold on. Yeah. Okay. So this is all under a summary of um, connect to all servers when logging in as admin. So different elements of this, right? Track which, well, hold on to a connection of server information using arbitrary keys. Um, you might consider these instance ID instance key instance um, ID instances connection instances. I'm not gonna leave this out. I'm not that doesn't help. Okay. Form the server. Hold on to collect. This not just say connection. Say collection. Hold on to the server. Collection form the server ser form the server collection from the client configuration. Whenever oh, I just realized we didn't handle removing old servers. The only way to test that would be to change the client configuration while we're already connected. So it's going to be hard to test. Do I even care? It's such a it's such a corner case. When would I ever remove a server? Oh, I know. I would do that all the time. Whenever I um, update the server, uh, the cluster configuration, it'll happen. So I need. I, I'll be able to test that later. Let's just let's maybe implement it, but not test it today. Form the server collection from the client configuration whenever it change when, um, on create or whenever it changes. Okay. Then um, form the server collection and connect to and establish connections on create and or whenever it, meaning the client configuration changes okay and then um see so track which server is involved well use the arbitrary arbitrary keys to track which server is involved in any uh message or notification callbacks That's about it, right? I think so. So let's just stage that. And I, um, before I move on, I do want to handle like if um, when the client, when the props change and a server gets removed. So that's on this uh, change, right? On new props. And this goes through all the ones in our current prop. So what about the servers we already put in our collection but aren't in here anymore? So that I want to handle by um, iterating the other direction. Basically for... Um, actually, I can do it here, right? Inside of here... Oh, and this is not even correct, right? Because this will make a WebSocket connection even if we already had one. Um, so I need to change, fix this too. This, this should do an early return if we're already connected. So if server.websocket.is some return. Right. And before we even do that, um, ah, another bug. They're coming out of the walls. 
Okay, so before we even connect to a server, we need to know, is it still in the um, set of, uh, of server infos? Then I don't want to iterate this. I want to iterate self dot, well. I want to iterate the keys we already have. These are all the ones we added just now. Or these all these are all the ones we should have. The ones that we, sh that we shouldn't have are the difference between what we already have and what um, we should have. So let um, old realm server keys equal self dot realm servers dot filter, I think, right? Or I can just say uh, keys dot filter key. Actually, I don't need to do a filter. I can do a difference, right? Isn't that called like um, difference? Or is that only with hash sets? So a filter is better than, is, is good enough. Key where um, now I might as well make this a hash set because that'll help me out in doing um, that contains. So only work if I import it. Contains has contains key not right. And then for every one of these, I want to remove it from the realm server list. So um, for old, for realm server key in old realm servers, self dot realm servers dot remove realm server key. So this drops old servers that have been removed. This this connects to ones that were added or the ones that we had that we just didn't have a connection yet to. No need for iter map key stuff. I'll need to m borrow that mutably. Are you saying I can do that instead of a filter? I can just do a, a, um, Oh, right. Yeah, actually it works, and that's an iterator, so I don't need to do a four. Yeah, you're right. So it would be what, um, four? Key in? Well, no, it, this won't work because, um, you can't call remove while you're iterating that, can you? Maybe you can. See if it'll let me do it. No, it's not going to let me do that. It's the error. Yeah, it's a multi-borrow. I have to do that. But now I'm curious. I thought I made a collection, but I didn't. Why is this letting me do it? It's not. I'm just dumb. This will only work if I, if I collect, actually. The reason why I'm collecting and removing because this needs to borrow self mutably. Uh, there. No, that. Or um, hold on, I got the type of this wrong. I think. Yeah, I need to do um, copied, and then this needs to be referenced because this is going to it's borrowing self mutably, right, to remove. And we can't do that if we're already iterating self. So, good night, Nui. Yeah, there, there, there are, I'm trying to avoid the borrow issues. I mean, it makes sense. You don't want to remove stuff from a collection that you're iterating, right? <laughs> so we need to iterate it first to pick out the things that you want to remove and then remove them. And then, um, and I could do these, I could add and then remove the old ones, or remove and then add, it doesn't really matter. But I do need to collect the ones we need to have first.
which is built from um, the hosts and ports we should have, and they may already be in the list, so they're just either need a connection or they they don't need anything at all, or they're new ones, or we'll definitely need a new connection. And then this one captures captures the ones that shouldn't be in there. Hey there, Paper Fan Games. How are you today? What's happening? I'm kind of wrapping up my stream today, but I've been working on the front end to a web app that runs in Rust. So, um, I've been working on this game for a while. Yeah, it's all in Rust. The production build of my game is not Rust. It's C++ and JavaScript, right? So it's, um, this is the admin view of it, so you can kind of see through walls and stuff, but the game client was all in JavaScript, and the backend server is in the custom engine in C++. And then I decided, hey, now that I know Rust, because I learned it last year, that it, I like it so much, let's rewrite my game in Rust. And I'm not even done with my game to begin with, so I kind of took a step back. So um, I have some of the back end in Rust, enough that I can start doing the front end. And so I've just been adding in the, um, the login mechanism. And part of the login mechanism is that when you log in as admin, that it um, looks at the client configuration and says, okay, there are three servers in the game, so let me connect all servers. The connections are all over WebSockets, right? So that's what I spent today on, is all the logic to go from the client configuration, which is what servers exist, to, hey, let's make a connection to each one of them and handle all the messages that go across. So um, I can show you that on the network tab, actually. If I just show WebSockets and I do... Uh, a reload and I uh, clear this and then do login you can see it makes three different connections and um, it's all binary now it used to be text but I switched to a binary format but this zero zero means um, identify as admin and then the um, zero one here means to answer an authentication challenge and then this zero zero in the other direction means authentication challenge so really high level the admin login procedure is server generates a random string of bytes. The client then um, signs it with a private RSA key and sends back the signature, and then the server verifies the signature is valid using the public key. How long have I been working on this? I think... Yeah, there it goes. So it's been a while. I mean, I don't stream every day, and I, t I take breaks. And this is more like my hobby, so... And I'm trying to do a lot of stuff from scratch. So all the, the back end is all from scratch. So it's been slower than a normal game dev would be. It's really what I'm doing is it's learning different technologies under the disguise of doing game dev. <laughs> You're also a game dev shop. You haven't done many games. Yeah, so I'm just kind of using game dev as a fun way in which to write stuff from scratch and learn new technologies like I learned Rust, I learned, I'm learning, I'm going to learn WebGL, I learned front-end web dev and all that stuff. Well, yeah, I've, I'm a long-time C++ developer recently indoctrinated into Rust, right? So, um, yeah. Once I learned Rust, I'm like, if they have Rust running in the browser, let's just do Rust for everything. Uh, what's really cool about that is that, um, hold on, I need to show it, lib.rs in uh, game public message. So the different variants of like what you can send as a client or what you can send as a server, I can define in one library along with all the code to serialize and deserialize that. So basically to, to uh, marshal it across a network connection and then that library is directly importable into both the front end and the back end. It's really sweet. So if I wanted to add a message like um, notify or, or subscribe subscribe to uh, game notifications and there, you know some some type here and I just hit save now both the front end and the back end when I recompile it they will understand that message. Now what we do with the message and how we uh, when we when we create the message that I have to write code for also, but it's just kind of neat that I can uh, have one place that's shared by both the front end and the back end for things like uh, the protocol between them. Library that can use yeah exactly. It's it's magic as performed by the infrastructure for WebAssembly. <laughs> 
Yeah. So um, I don't have a. I should make a command for this, but like, if you're curious about this, you just Google "Are we web yet?" And um, there's a bunch of "Are we" sites, but they're all Rust related, and it kind of says oh, how mature the Rust environment is for um, web dev. So they talk about back end and front end. The front end is um, they'll they'll you'll you'll be um, guided towards WebAssembly because Rust is a compiled language and you have to compile to some target. And the WebAssembly target is um, bytecode that um, most browsers these days can execute and that you can generate by compiling most languages that are LLVM based. So it's pretty cool. I've heard that you can also make WebAssembly by compiling C, C++. So technically you could write front end code in C++ now, although I haven't done it yet. But yeah, it's really, it's really fun stuff. So um, I was mostly working today on the uh, mechanism for um, managing a whole list of servers, which is, uh, it, it's all revolved around the state of the playing activity. So playing activity has a map of realm servers. We maintain what's the host and port, port number, and then we have, this is our handle to the web socket. And uh, whenever our props change, I call on new props, and um, so it collects um, from the server information what are um, the um, host and port numbers, and then it says, well, if we already have an entry for that, keep it, otherwise make a new one, and then um, find out what are all the servers that we need to drop, drop them, and then connect to the new ones that we haven't connected to. So if we already have a WebSocket, that's okay. Otherwise, we uh, make some, uh, these are our callbacks, and this is how we connect to the, to the server over WebSockets. So this is a adaptation layer in the U framework around the web APIs that are um, wrapped into Rust using this library called WebSys. So ultimately, it goes to the web browser's internal web a APIs to um, tell the web browser to open a WebSocket connection to wherever we want to go, right? And um, it, uh, all this wrapper stuff calls us back through um, uh, functions that we provide. So in Rust, we provide a, like a closure, this closure here that we want called whenever we receive a message. And that's through this, th this, this is part of the U framework. It takes that closure and says, whenever um, the uh, underlying web API calls us back, we're gonna invoke this closure and it's supposed to generate a message that then we're gonna send back to your update function. So like um, when we receive a message from the WebSocket, um, it gets packaged into this WebSocket message and then fed back to our update, me update function. So it'll end up right here. And if it's a text message, we ignore it. If it's an error right now, I ignore it, although I probably shouldn't. If it's a binary message, and then I'm going through that common deserialization code that I showed you earlier to turn it back in from bytes into a message and then handle it. And like, for example, handling an authentication challenge is if we have a private key, then we're going to sign the challenge with the key and that's asynchronous again. So it uses one of these callback things. Um, signing the key is we are again going through the web APIs to get to the browser's crypto library, this crypto subtle library specifically, and using this algorithm, the RSA PKCS1, it's going to sign this um, challenge that we got from the server and uh, taking that signature, we're then going to call our own callback to generate this auth response ready message, which I use to then send it as a binary message back through across the WebSocket. So it's pretty neat. I, I'm, I'm really enjoying this development. I like that I can do the entire game front and back in the same language most of, most of the time. There's a little bit of glue in other languages, but that's okay. So I'm looking forward to keeping going. But that said, I'm running into my hard stop limit, so I need to wind down the stream and end. So there are a few more or less questions. Let me know, otherwise I'm going to start winding things down. Technically, you can compile Go into WebAssembly as well. It's not as popular, though. Yeah, that's true. Let's go as more featureful runtime results in bigger binaries. That's maybe a concern if you're going to use any kind of WebAssembly in the browser. Like, I was looking at the sizes of what I'm compiling, and I'm not doing much in the front end yet, and yet... Um, 
if I go to UI dist, I think that WebAssembly is almost two megabytes now. <laughs> now, granted, I'm not doing the production build, so it gets smaller with the production build, but still, it doesn't get that much smaller. Um, so that's a concern that you might have if your web app is large, that the WebAssembly could be a, a, a big heavy brick to deal with. If I compile in release mode, it might be faster. But nevertheless, it's a concern, right? You can't just say, hey, it's just magic. The magic comes with a little bit of a price. <laughs> so in some cases, like, it might benefit you to keep some parts in JavaScript because they'll load faster, right? But who knows? Many tricks you can employ to get smaller wallets. Yeah, so you might have to pull out some more tools from your tool belt to, um, to compensate goes bigger because it packs its runtime into the executable but in the web yeah well when we use these web uh, apis we're leveraging the fact that they're um they're implemented in the browser and so um like this utilities right this uh crypto library we don't include that in the web assembly it's um built into the browser so we get it for almost free we have to have a little bit of wrapper around it and of course um it has to be in the browser, so you can't... This won't work unless the browser supports cryptography. Most of them do, so you don't have to worry about it. But, yeah, there's... it's it's. If you can use the built-in stuff in the browser, it makes your app smaller, too. All right. What did I do here? Oh, right. This was um, make... Uh, well, drop connections to servers no longer in the configuration. That's what this does. So um, drop old servers. Uh, wrong key. Control S, please. And that should probably be a dot. Commit. Before I forget, I'm going to push this all. And I need to find someone to rate because i got to go. How big is the JS version of the front end? Um, I can take a look. The last one I built. Uh, where was... Is that target? can't remember where it was. Build. Hmm... I don't think this is a production build, though. I... Oh, build static. That's where it is. JS. There we go. So ignore the map files. Those are only used for debugging. So it's... This is a lot more features, because this is all the stuff I did for the production system. Um... So it's substantial, but there's a lot more code in there. I don't. I, I would just hazard a guess that with WebAssembly would be like an an order of magnitude larger, but I, I have no idea. Don't think WebAssembly still doesn't have a free. In general, your WebAssembly still be significantly smaller than most of your assets. I guess I really shouldn't um, give an opinion because I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it. I guess it's pretty big. So, like, at a certain point, I might want to look into, like, compression and stuff. Other tricks to pull out of the bag. This is a nifty screen to keep up while I'm choosing someone, so I'll do that. This is how we use Rust to call the web APIs in the browser to generate a cryptographic signature. Isn't that cool? Let me go find someone to raid. Is there someone new who hasn't been streaming the last couple days? Is it JS Minified? I think it is, but I'm not sure. I guess we can um, look at it. Well, uh, I don't know. Yes and no. I guess the variable names are really small. Does that mean it's minified? It kind of looks minified, doesn't it? I'm going to say that it's Decently minified, yes. Don't know if we can say the same thing about the WebAssembly, though. Don't know enough about it yet. Yeah, I've been given the signal that... a reminder that I need to go. All right. Oh, this is a fun guy to raid. Let's see if he... what's he, what's he doing? 
I got an ad, so I'll wait for a second. One letter names only need a white space and keywords. Yeah. Yeah, but can't, can't you do even more aggressive tricks? Like you could change... I thought in JavaScript you could do things like take words like return and make them even shorter with some kind of tr weird tricks. Oh, this is a long ad that I'm getting. <laughs> All right, almost done. Okay, he's going, so we'll rate him. Jolt Jab. He's an entertaining streamer doing game dev and uh, usually in Unity, right? So he's working on this game today again. Save the hero. Hope you enjoy him. And I hopefully will be back tomorrow. So, yeah, thank you for watching so much. And I hope to see you next time. Jolt Jab. Here we go. Let's see, while that's queuing up, let me see what I need to do. So probably tomorrow, yeah, I'm going to be handling authentication failures. And that, that we don't reconnect if it fails. And then I'm going to play around with like dropping connections to servers and make sure our front end reconnects automatically. That's probably what I'll be doing tomorrow. So I hope to see you then. Take care, everybody, now. Bye.